the mechanism for the origin of life is one of the biggest open questions in modern science. Hey guys, Grayson here. Today's based theory is over abiogenesis, that is, life from non-life. Most of us are familiar with the criteria of life learned about in middle school. I'm alive, you're alive, dogs are alive, plants are alive, but it is worth noting that there is some gray area, for example, viruses, which kind of have some properties of life, but not all of the criteria are met, and viruses are typically not considered as living. Now, we know that at one point, life had to have come from non-life. After all, there was a point in the previous history of the universe in which there was no life possible because the whole universe was a plasma, and there were not even any atoms formed yet. So we know that at some point, life had to have come from non-life, as in non-living constituents, as in atoms, molecules, and chemicals. But the details for mechanistically how this process happened are still a mystery in modern science. There are plenty of hypotheses under the greater umbrella of origin of life research. Uh, for decades, the most popular one, uh, certainly the hypothesis that I learned about in, under, in college, was the RNA world hypothesis. But in recent years, many scientists in the field have been moving away from the traditional RNA world hypothesis and have been seeking other more comprehensive hypotheses to explain how life got started on this planet. Enter my personal favorite of these newer hypotheses, the amyloid world hypothesis, the topic for today's video. Now before we start, I should mention that this is still very new science. Most of what we're going to be talking about is from just the last decade or so, and there are really only a small handful of scientists working on this area. Uh, origin of life research is typically not very well funded. Not many scientists do it in general, so just specifically talking about the amyloid world hypothesis, there's really only two scientists that are publishing on this by name, although there are more scientists working more generally on amyloids. And for today's video, I will be relying mostly on a review article on the amyloid world hypothesis by one of these main key authors, CPJ Mori. Link below. But before we get into this, we have to talk about what is an amyloid. Well, an amyloid is a type of protein. Now we know that proteins are made up of amino acids uh, put together in a sequence. Now most proteins, like enzymes, enzymes are proteins with jobs, most proteins need a specific sequence of, of amino acids in order to have the right shape to do the right function for their job. But amyloids are fairly independent, they are robust of sequence to a large degree. Now that is because amyloids are, are identified based on their shape and the properties that they have in three-dimensional space. So typically, amyloids will adopt what is called a beta pleated sheet structure. It's called a pleated sheet because it kind of looks like a sheet of paper, but it's not exactly straight and planar. It's got all these kind of crumples on the surface. This pleated sheet structure is much more stable than a typical peptide would be. Now, similar to viruses, amino acid aggregates, like amyloids, can actually function quite similarly to a virus. Specifically, we're talking about prions. Now, prions are not exactly the same thing as amyloids. Uh, they are misfolded proteins. So you have a protein that would normally form a certain way to do its enzymatic job. But if it misfolds, it can actually cause somewhat of a chain reaction and cause other proteins of that same type to similarly misfold and kind of spread itself in a similar way that a virus would. And actually, there are many diseases that are prion diseases, as in they're not diseases that are caused by viruses or bacteria, but they're caused by these misfolded proteins called prions. And actually, the most famous one, you may have heard of it, is mad cow disease. These are typically very horrific diseases that you definitely do not want. But the point is that these prions, at least functionally, 
are doing something very similar to something a bacteria would do. You know, it infests the host, it replicates itself within the host, and it seems to spread that information about its misfolded sequence. And I bring this up to highlight that these protein aggregates, remember both amyloids and prions are aggregates of amino acids that have this very interesting ability. The prions highlight this well. They can store and spread information. In this case, it was information about this folding of the prions that is being stored and spread to other proteins in the body. It should be noted actually that a lot of these unique characteristics of prions actually are due to the amyloid fold, the actual amyloid structures within prions. So a lot of the prion activity can be chalked up to uh, the amyloid structures. So prions are kind of, can be thought of as a subset of amyloids. But in order to explain how they do this, how amyloids can encode and pass on information in a way that is very similar to genetics, how DNA and RNA store and replicate information. But this is without utilizing any DNA or RNA. This is before genetics. This is only using amino acids and proteins. We have to talk about the structure of amyloids. And the structure of amyloids is absolutely key to how they function into origin of life research. Typically, most peptides are fairly unstable and will degrade. But when you start having peptides that are coming together it, to form these beta pleated sheets, which does happen naturally, it has been done in experiment using as close as we can approximate to prebiotic earth conditions, amyloids will form naturally in the presence of volcanic gases like carbonyl sulfide, which occur naturally on earth, uh, specifically like at hydrothermal vents. This seems like one of the most likely spots for most hypotheses of abiogenesis, just because you have such a confluence of organic materials, minerals, energy sources. So at these vents, you have the volcanic gases, which can catalyze peptide reactions and form these chains of amino acids. These kinds of conformations, they're much more stable. And what happens here is a sort of positive feedback where new amino acids can be added onto the amyloid, as in onto that sheet can extend and just new amino acids can be extended onto it and it can sort of grow organically. So the sheet of paper is getting longer and longer. And the very interesting thing about the, this process is that not any amino acid is equal in this. Some amino acids are going to be favored as kind of fitting more snugly into that position than others. So it does sort of, it, the, the previous amyloid acts as a template for which the, the sequence of amino acids can be extended. So it's self-replicating its own sequence in a way. And now this is not a perfect process. There's going to be, I mean, this is way too early to be calling them mutations, but there's going to be variation in the amino acid sequence. It's not just going to be replicated with exact fidelity every time. And this is key to evolutionary processes. And one of the key details to note here is that actually the, the handedness of the amino acid does matter. There are left-handed and there are right-handed uh, confirmations of amino acids and all of life today is left-handed so it's been a big open question this chirality problem of handedness and so this provides a potential solution because the right-handed amino acids would not be added onto a left-handed amyloid the, the only the left-handed it is preferentially picking just the confirmations of amino acids that fit kind of like a lock and key into this template structure that the amino that the amyloid is is building off of and that's just one of the ways in which amyloids can replicate can can replicate themselves and information about themselves in this case it had to do with the sequence of the am amino acids of the amyloid 
but there's another mechanism as well. And this is kind of similar to how the prions can replicate their three-dimensional form, like the misfolding of the protein can be replicated to other proteins. In this case, a uh, the three-dimensional information about the amyloid, which can be affected by the environment, factors in the environment can change the shape of the amyloid. And actually those confirmations can then be passed uh, to, to other amyloids, um, kind of generations of other amyloids. And, and there are um, ways once an amyloid gets too long, it can fragment uh, and split in two, and then those can start elongating. Now you can also have vast networks of these amyloid fibrils that are all stacked with each other, and they can actually continue to catalyze the formation of more amyloids. So they are self-replicating in this way they and they continue to replicate more of themselves like themselves but with slight variation and this is the very basis for darwinian evolution i mentioned earlier that enzymes are proteins with jobs with functions so far the only function that we've described for amyloid is its self-replicating function but here's the really interesting and cool part about amyloids they are multifunctional one amyloid can accomplish multiple functions, and this has also been demonstrated. So in addition to replicating itself, amyloids can actually catalyze other reactions. Specifically, they can catalyze the formation of their own building blocks. So they can, they can catalyze the formation of the building blocks that they need to add to themselves to continue to elongate and, and replicate. They can also catalyze ATPase reactions in the presence of metals. So what did we talk about? That there are lots of metals, minerals, and organic molecules all amassing at hydrothermal vents. Now, if an amyloid fi fiber network is present in one of these hydrothermal vents, they can incorporate these organic molecules in onto their structure and catalyze reactions to continue to form the necessary ingredients for them to continue to replicate. Now this is an early form of a metabolism. And again, all of these catalytic functions of amyloids have been documented in experiment. And if you've seen my video on ATP, then you already know of its central role in metabolism and how it's likely to have predated DNA in the evolution of life. And as we indicated earlier, amyloids have the ability to hydrolyze ATP, as in they have the ability to utilize the energy from ATP, which forms at these hydrothermal vents. And the great thing about hydrothermal vents is that they make their own proton gradients. In our bodies today, the reason why we need to breathe oxygen is to establish proton gradients. But back at the prebiotic Earth, proton gradients were formed naturally at hydrothermal vents, which are key and integral in forming ATP in the first place. Let me break this down as simply as possible. All of the building blocks that go into the formation of amyloids have all been shown to be naturally occurring, as has the process of amyloid formation itself, so you have these amyloids being formed with essentially random sequences. There are certain sequences that are more favored in amyloid formation, so it's not truly random, but uh, among there are many, many different sequences that will form amyloids. So as that happens, the amyloids that are more stable will stick around for longer than the ones that are less stable and will continue to incorporate new amino acids and elongate themselves, that is to replicate their own sequence. From there, the amyloids that can elongate themselves faster have a advantage over the stable but very slowly elongating amyloids. And eventually, in a population of amyloids, the more faster replicators are going to predominate, just based on the rules of natural selection. So, 
whichever factors allow for the amyloids to replicate the fastest and be the most stable are going to be the factors that are selected for. So when an amyloid, which all have an innate catalytic ability, when these amyloids begin to catalyze some of the steps that lead to faster replication times, those are going to be preferentially selected for. So after many rounds of this self-replication, what you're going to end up with is amyloids that are getting better and better at catalyzing the reactions that go into making themselves. And they're going to be utilizing an energy source to do that. And ATP is another naturally occurring energy source near hydrothermal vents. So we know that amyloids have ATPase activity, they can utilize the energy of ATP to do work. And once you develop this interaction between amyloids and ATP, it's only a matter of time until you, until you start having refinements into the information storing system, uh, the, the stringing of ATP and different triphosphate nucleotides together into DNA and RNA, the incorporation of lipids, uh, which are again found naturally at hydrothermal vents and which spontaneously form bilayer membranes, as well as the creation of protein enzymes to do specific functions. These specific, specific proteins that are not amyloids can be formed within the pockets of these amyloid fiber networks. So amyloids alone can do many of the functions that we now incorporate as criteria of life. Now, hopefully you have a better idea about why the amyloid world hypothesis is my personal favorite origin of life theory, just because of its sheer power to explain so much about the origins of life and why things are the way they are today. Amyloids can encode information, store it, and pass it along to future generations. They can replicate themselves based on the parent template, they can catalyze all manner of different reactions and they can undergo Darwinian evolution. They can also select specific chiralities and conformations of organic molecules. So you have all these steps together. You have the amyloids, which are capable of this self-replication with uh, inherited modification, which is evolution, and they interact with metals, minerals, ATP, and organic building blocks in order to establish these metabolisms to fuel their own self-replication. This sounds an awful lot like the origin of life. If you still have any questions or if there's another topic that you'd like to see me cover in the future, please let me know down below in the comments Liking the video also helps out a ton for the algorithm and subscribe if you want to see more content like this.